Hello and welcome to the University of Chicago Career Month webinar, A Perspective on the Energy Industry with Jennifer Montague. Jennifer is a dual alumna of the University of Chicago, both from the lab school and also receiving her MBA from Booth in Marketing and Finance. And she's going to share her perspective today on working in the fields of petrochemical, oil, and gas and utilities. Currently, Jennifer is the Director, Business, Director of Business Strategy and Technology at ComEd, and before ComEd, she was at BP for over 20 years. In addition to this amazing career in the energy industry, she serves on the board of the Merritt School of Music, the Women Energy Network of Chicago, and she's on the Racial Justice Committee of the Shriver Center. And when I asked Jennifer what job she wanted to do when she was a child, she told me that her childhood self would have told us all that she wanted to be President of the United States. So with ambition like that, I can't wait to hear the story of Jennifer's career in the energy industry. All right. Thanks. Thanks so much, Lucy. That always makes me laugh when I hear that I used to want to be President of the United States. Um, so I'm going to spend some time um, talking to you today about the energy industry. Um, I'll talk to you a bit about sort of my career path. Um, and I'll speak a bit about some of the um, uh, transformations that I see taking place in the energy industry, um, and then just sh share with you some overall tips that I think is um, helpful to be successful in energy or really any, any career overall. Um, so I've navigated the energy industry in a variety of areas, and Lucy alluded to it, but I started off in the petroleum industry and petrochemicals, then I went to refining and marketing of gasoline, um, to alternative energy, and then biofuels, and then now I've been in um, utilities um, for the past few years. And I, uh, before I sort of walk through my career journey, I did want to give you guys um, a bit of a, a shout out to Eclon, because that's the company that I've been working for for the last seven years. I just wanted to share some background on um, Exelon. So Exelon is a Fortune 100 company. Um, we are every stage of the energy business, um, from excuse me, power generation to um, competitive energy marketing to transmission and delivery. And uh, that's the side of the business that I'm on in terms of utilities. Um, Exelon is the world's, uh, I mean, is America's um, leading energy provider. We've got the cleanest fleet, and our utilities serve um, millions of uh, electric and gas companies, um, customers, excuse me. We have about 34,000 um, employees, and our annual revenue is $31.4 billion. Um, and just some things I wanted to show you on this slide are some of the things that I think are really exciting about working in Exelon. Um, so we've had some uh, recognition, particularly in the areas of diversity and inclusion. So Diversity Inc. named as a top 50 company for diversity. Um, we, in the past year, have signed a number of diversity inclusion initiatives around the Equal Play Pledge. We joined the Heat or She initiative on gender equity. We have a stand on behalf of our DACA folks. And, um, and then just, you know, we are the only utility energy company in the billion dollar round table. Um, and we've been in uh, Civic, uh, Civic 50 by Points of Light Foundation top utility. Um, so it's a really dynamic and fun organization um, to work in and to be a part of. All right, I'll spend a little bit of time walking through my um, career journey, and I've shown it here pictorially, but I'll, I'll spend a lot, uh, quite a bit of time walking you through this. So I began working in the energy industry somewhat serendipitously. Um, I grew up in Chicago. Like Lucy said, I went to lab school. And when I graduated, I was a National Achievement Scholar, and Amoco was assigned as my corporate sponsor. So they paid a $20,000 scholarship for me to go to Stanford. And uh, my mom, who was my very first mentor, um, asked at the uh, foundation ceremony if I could get a job. Um, so that <laughs> resistance paid off, and I actually um, interned for three summers and then started working for them after graduation. And specifically, um, when I started working for them, I was in the petrochemical industry. So I want you to think plastic resin, um, and uh, it, plastic resin sort of in the consumer and industrial marketing. So think of plastic going into yogurt cups, toys, um, computers. And I um, had a sales training program. I moved to Detroit, which is that fourth picture along there. Um, and I uh, had a sales territory of Michigan, Indi um, Indiana, Kentucky, and uh, um, Southern Illinois. And I, uh, I adored being in sales. Um, it really suited my strengths, it suited my personality, um, getting to know um, owners of companies. Um, and you know, I called on small and large companies, but um, uh, getting to know owners of companies, sort of really marketing what our strengths were, were um, in terms of our plastic resin. Um, but I, uh, I had a mentor who urged me to go um, back to school. 
And so I returned to Chicago, there's that picture there, um, to uh, go to Booth School of Business. And this is a blessing because Amico paid for me to get my MBA full-time and to work part-time. So I got my MBA in finance and marketing. Now after I graduated um, from Booth, and then it wasn't called Booth, then it was called GSB, um, I went into a role in mergers and acquisitions. And this is still with Amico, and I looked at potential acquisitions like Arco Chemical. Um, I actually did a divestiture of one of our fabrics and fiber plants in um, Australia, and it was really exciting. Um, the oil industry was consolidating. Um, oil prices were low at about $17 a barrel, and we were really looking at potential future opportunities. Um, and so with that came a lot of international travel. Um, I ended up traveling to Geneva, Sydney, Tokyo, and that really sparked my interest in having an international um, role. Um, directly after that, I was promoted into a role in Atlanta in marketing engineering polymers. So again, beforehand I told you I was doing sort of classic resins going into um, to lower end, now I want you to think high end, so aircraft, medical um, field, going into that kind of equipment. And this was an opportunity for me to really use um, the marketing that I learned in business school. And uh, at the same time, I, I had a, um, while I was in this role, I had an opportunity to um, meet my husband. I actually ended up um, interviewing him at the National Black MBA conference. Um, and he actually ended up working for Amico, um, interning for Amico one summer, and that's how we um, met and started dating. Um, during that whole courtship period, BP purchased Amico. And my uh, VP and mentor, a different one this time, again, this is a, a a, a, a series in my career. I've had several different kinds of mentors who have all um, mentored me in different ways. But um, a mentor at that time didn't want me to get caught up in some of the ring fence roles that would be resulting from the merger and really made opportunity for me to move back to Chicago. Um, so that coincided with our wedding and um, coincided with my next role, which is in the top upper left, where I was a refinery supply and planning manager. And that picture is pretty hard to see, but basically I was responsible for managing pipelines, flows from chemicals. So I was basically um, managing the propylene monomer supply chain through refineries, suppliers, and derivatives customers. And the industry was improving at this point. Oil prices were rising to about $46 a barrel. Um, but I didn't really love this role, if I'm honest. I kept trying to turn it into a marketing role. Um, and it wasn't. Um, uh, polymers are relatively, um, uh, uh, propylene monomer is relatively fungible. So you know our propylene and, and our ethylene was the same as everyone else's, but I kept trying to turn it into a marketing job. Um, and then in 2011, which coincided with the birth of my daughter, um, so you'll see a picture there with her tongue sticking out, I left chemicals for the first time and I went into a refining and marketing job um, at BP. And I ran the um, credit card marketing group. So think about sort of BP Visa or um, I think many of you guys on the phone, maybe your very first credit card might have been um, it either was a store credit card or it might have been a, um, a, um, a gas credit card. But, um, so I ran you know, the BP Visa, multi-card, fleet, prepaid card. And this was an opportunity for me to drive value for our dealers and jobbers, um, so people who actually own our BP sites, but also work on some new product development um, with BP Visa. And it was the first time also that I moved from um, B2B, because previously I had been working on sort of selling plastic resins to businesses like you know, Mattel and Whirlpool and um, Ford. So it's the first time I moved from B to B to sort of B to C and actually start working on end use customers. But I would say this is also during a period of declining credit card sales and declining oil process prices, and we were faced with a um, team consolidation. And I ended up managing um, my team consolidation. I think we had 16 people, and I ended up managing it down to three. And this is actually a precursor for my next role. Um, and uh, at, at BP and also at my husband's urging, um, you know, I expressed interest in an international assignments and landed an expatriate role in London as strategy manager for communications and engagement. And what was pretty amazing about that role was this was during a period of time where BP had purchased a number of different companies. So they purchased Deva, Aral, and Castrol, and um, you know, Amico. And they basically needed to manage communications and strategy for a company and work on a number of different efficiencies. And so that's what my role was. I managed the communication process and developed some key messages for a European restructuring of about 2,500 employees in 28 countries. So again, that small experience that I've had earlier doing that for my um, credit card team I had to do um, across a number of different um, countries. 
And um, I also ended up managing the communications plan for the merger of chemical into the refining marketing business and also gave birth to my son. Um, now, I also wanted to show a picture of, um, you see a picture of my, sort of my mom and I dancing there because my mother went with us to London to help um, watch the kids. Um, so when we went over, um, my daughter was, was born and my son was born there, but my mom um, uh, you know, stayed with us for all four years that we were there and that made a huge, huge difference in our lives and the fact that um, you know, my husband was able to work. He got a terrific job at Transport for London doing strategy. I was able to work and um, we got a chance to sort of um, travel. Um, so it, it, making sure that you have really good, um, good work-life balance I think is, is pretty critical. Um, and then um, climate change really became an in increasing focus for many um, countries. So emissions from energy use has created lots of health hazards in developing countries. And countries were concerned about security of energy supplies and looking for ways to diversify energy. And demand of electricity at that point was expected to double by 2030. And increasing CO2 emissions from power generations were up by about 70%. And so the CEO uh, at that time was um, Lord John Brown. And he was really at the forefront of this movement and focusing on renewable energy resources. So in 2005, BP decided to spend about $8 billion in alternative energy over a 10-year period and moved to have lots of investment in solar and wind and hydrogen, biofuels, um, gas-fired power, hydrogen, and distributed energy. Um, and that was actually biomass and paraffin. And so um, with, with that move in 2006, I moved to external communications and I started marketing our biofuels, um, um, our biofuels business. And then later I moved to marketing the alternative energy business. Um, and this was really, really thrilling to me. I, this, this felt like, you know, sort of hit my sweet spot. Um, I ended up managing communications for the launch of the Energy Biosciences Institute, so that was a half a billion dollar launch. Um, I ended up managing the communications for the launch of our biofuels business. Um, we ended up having a huge partnership with DuPont um, um, on a specific product. Uh, and so we, I managed the launch of that. And then also we had a, a program um, called Target Neutral, which were for customers to basically reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And so I became really passionate about this. And um, then the CEO ended up resigning from BP under a number of different controversial circumstances. And I was repatriated uh, to Chicago in 2007. Um, now I will say um, the new CEO um, who took over after Lord John Brown le left was the CEO, his name is Tony Hayward. And he decided that BP's core competency was not renewable. And he set about to sell and eliminate some portions of the BP's alternative energy business. Um, and um, that was also during a period of time when the economy crashed, right? The economy crashed in 2008. And that caused oil prices to plummet from $157 a barrel to about $48 a barrel. Um, so, you know, it wasn't just that he was, you know, short-sighted, but it was also that he was looking at sort of where oil prices were and um, the fact that the investment in a number of these um, alternative energies didn't seem in that period of time um, to make, uh, that they were going to be financially viable. And during that period of time, my alternative energy communications role was eliminated. Now, I was rescued by um, another mentor who I had, really I would say this person was a sponsor, and I was moved back into the chemicals business doing marketing and sustainability for the um, polyester, polyester beverage um, market. But I, you know, I, took a, I took a long time to sort of um, um, think about this and think about the future of the organization, and I really believed that renewables were part of the future and that energy companies that focused on an all-in energy approach were much more likely to be viable in the long run. Also, you'll remember in 2008, um, Obama um, was elected, and I really thought the Obama administration would put a place on, um, would put a price on carbon, and I thought they would shift the burden back to the, you know, shift the burden of the damage back to those who are responsible for it and those who could reduce it. So I started to look for other roles outside of BP. Now, I specifically was deliberate in looking for a company that focused on clean energy and had a commitment to reduce greenhouse gases. And so I targeted Exelon and um, started having discussions in 2009 and was hired in February of 2010 as the Director of Marketing in ComEd. 
And um, I will just say, um, coincidentally, that was, that was two months before um, the BP oil spill. Um, so that sort of um, was my my um, my life journey at um, BP. Now, I actually also when I came over, I thought Exelon would be uniquely positioned um, with its energy production. Um, I also expected in you know 2010, I expected oil prices to continue to rise. I expected that production in U.S. crude would fall. Um, but but like many in the industry, I did not correctly predict the gas the gas shale boom, and that U.S. Um, oil production would start to rise, um, and that the next, you know, the next seven years would be the fastest oil production increase in um, uh, U.S. history. And so, instead of continued declines from 2008, the production of uh, crude oil and natural gas liquids increased by about six million barrels a day. Um, so, I, again, I, I'll just sort of name that I, I did not correctly, you know, I, I, I was really deliberate about saying, you know, hey, I want to pick, pick a, a company that's, you know, really great in terms of renewables, but I, that I, you know, did not correctly predict that. Um, so that aside, though, I spent many years in oils and chemicals, but I really had to learn the utilities um, business. And many of the forces that were shaping the utilities industry were the same, right? The utilities industry had previously relied heavily on coal. And you know that's the most carbon-intensive fuel to generate electricity, and carbon emissions from electricity generation have been increasing globally, um, increased globally. I'm sorry, by 50 percent between 2000 and 2013, and, and at the same time, it had to focus on greenhouse gases. Um, also, and it's not really depicted in the slide, but energy had historically earned income on higher usage, right? So um, you know the Energy Information um, Association. Report said electric sale, electricity sales growth since 2002 has really hovered around 1% a year. And demand has declined in about five of those years for a variety of reasons, right? Slowing population growth, but also the rise of, of uh, energy efficiency technologies. And that has re depressed demand. Um, so, you know, there's a 2% growth in electricity between the 80s and 90s, and now it's down to 1%, which may not seem like a huge amount, but it, it is actually pretty huge. So I joined as director of marketing to try to revitalize some of those marketing programs and adopt, um, drive adoption of energy efficiency programs. But these are the very things that were resulting in sort of overall lower growth. Um, however, you know, um, we've ended up, uh, we've ended up with one of the most robust energy efficiency programs in the nation. And we actually, uh, because we recognized some of the loss in overall demand, we actually ended up formalizing legislation where we get to earn on our energy efficiency programs like an asset. So instead of it being a net loss to our income, we get to earn on it like an asset, which is pretty huge. Um, so a, a large part of my marketing role was to develop sort of, you know, education and awareness plan for the Energy um, Infrastructure Modernization Act. Now, to get to the slide in terms of some things that are changing really in the power and utilities industry. So power plants in the grid um, that they feed really are aging and, to be honest, flew, bl flew blind for, you know, the most, most of the century. And, um, you know, utility companies worldwide have been investing in upgrading their grids. Um, and automating distribution and looking at, you know, new software and grid analytics tools and putting new meters in place. And so um, for ComEd specifically, we ended up investing about $2.6 billion in upgrading our infrastructure throughout our service territory and replacing thousands of miles of our underground cable and our utility poles to really try to improve power reliability. We added digital sensors and two-way communications that reroute power when there's trouble um, and we also invested in smart meters throughout the service territory. Um, now, that doesn't sound that sexy and exciting, but the reason why that was important is because we were largely unaware of an outage until a customer calls a complaint. Most people sort of think, you know, oh yeah, the utility knows that I'm out of power, but we, we didn't. We used to like to say, you know, on star can turn on your car from many miles away. We can't even, we couldn't even turn on your energy because we didn't even, we couldn't even turn on your power because we didn't know that it wasn't on until we put smart meters in place. Um, so now customers with smart meters, smart meters, you know, transmit real-time data, and we've currently got about 3.6 million meters that are in. Um, but, you know, before we started this process, we didn't have any smart meters in. So smart meters can identify when and how customers are using this electricity. They can help customers, you know, conserve power and save on their bills. Um, and as part of the... Um, as part of the work that I did in marketing, I developed, you know, sort of an education and awareness plan and had to explain to customers, you know, look, here's why 
you know, some of these new technologies are more useful. Um, and that ranged from, you know, grassroots education and awareness. Um, so, for example, we ended up having some energy force ambassadors. We were the first utility in the nation to uh, basically work with developmentally disabled um, individuals to serve as ambassadors for us. And then we also have traditional um, um, advertising to explain our energy efficiency. So you will have seen or heard, heard probably billboards, direct mail, door hangers, radio and TV to explain about um, energy efficiency and also explain about some of the investments that we've made. Um, from that role, though, I ended up moving into a role of Director of Revenue Management. And in that role, I was accountable for the accounts receivables portfolio, credit collections, payment processing, and the daily operations of our billing and payment vendors. And I showed you this slide because I was also accountable for managing our low-income assistance program. So about a third of the folks in the common service territory are actually low-income. And um, low-income low customers face a much larger energy burden um, than, the, than you know, middle class and um, upper class folks in terms of, um, you know, they have less, much less efficient housing. Um, they may not actually be able to make changes to their house to make their homes more energy efficient. Um, and we've seen that some low-income houses end up um, um, engaging in some, some, some specifically sometimes unsafe behavior, right? They close off part of their home or they've kept their homes at an unsafe or unhealthy temperature, or they've used a stove or oven for heat. Um, and so managing these low-income assistance programs, you've got a chance to um, really, really work with customers. And this, I think, was specific. Um, um, I'll back up. I also ended up seeing, uh, on the flip side of this, I, because I think I told you I was in charge of revenue management, we actually also had to collect money. And one of the ways we, could, we, we collect money is sort of disconnect customers when they weren't paying, when they got to the point of not being able to pay. There were long-term business programs for people who couldn't pay, but we also had some people who just wouldn't pay. And for the people who wouldn't pay, we ended up um, shutting them off. And so I, uh, with, with the advent of putting all the smart meters in place, I also oversaw the inauguration of using the remote disconnect switch, which not only would shut off customers, but also would enable them to be reconnected more quickly in the event of a disconnection. Um, and if any of you work in um, local government, you will remember that the state budget deficit occurred in um, 2015 and ended up leaving many of our customers no avenue to apply for our low-income assistance program. Um, and so I ended up leading a strategy to set up um, uh, low-income assistance sites at churches and, munis and municipal um, community centers for customers um, for during a three-month period when um, the state budget deficit had shut down all of the low-income assistance programs, including LIHEAP and PIP. And um, the reason this is significant is because we manage a $10 million program a year where customers can get assistance, where they can get grants, basically, to help them pay, pay for their bills. And so we were actually out in the community um, allowing people to get access to our residential special hardship. And then, you know, people would come in and they were disconnected. We could actually use the remote disconnect switch while they were still there. Um, apply the grant and get them turned back on. Um, so that was a uh, uh, pretty gratifying experience. Um, and around this time in my career, I started to take a sort of a deeper assessment of my strengths and some opportunities that I had for development. Um, so I would encourage um, many, I would encourage you if you haven't had an opportunity to, to, to do this, but to look at strengths finders. Um, uh, which, you know, you take a little quiz, but it's also a book where sort of, which ends up ranking your strengths. And I also ended up getting a, um, a coach to sort of help me through identifying um, the things that were, you know, real strengths for me and the things that were, you know, opportunities for me um, to continue to learn um, um, in the industry. So I'd, I'd encourage you to think about some of that self-reflection. Um, and from there, then, I was tapped to move into the role that I'm in now, which is Director of Strategy and Technology, and that's my current role. So in this role, I end up, um, I oversee ComEd's um, premier customer experience strategy, um, which really focuses on driving, um, two things, focuses on trying to impact customer culture, I mean, impact company culture around being much more customer focused, and also focuses on trying to identify process improvements that we can identify to improve the customer experience and make things more seamless for the experience, for the company. I also oversee all of our e-channels organization, which includes our web, our mobile app, 
uh, social media and IVR. Um, and I've also got strategy and support services um, for customer operations. And then to keep me humble, I manage all of our customer complaints that get escalated to the ICC and our um, senior executives. And um, um, we've had a number of different sort of shifts in the industry from a te technological um, standpoint. So the industry is changing much, much like others, but through, you know, through some advances in technology, right, everything is smaller and faster and much more automated. Um, the, there's a bit huge explosion in data, um, um, and there's a move towards sort of, you know, smart everything, so connected devices, internet of things. Um, but I think more importantly from a customer experience standpoint is that there is an expectation from customers that utilities start acting like everyone else. So I will say that there was a period of time, actually not even a period of time, when I joined ComEd, they didn't even call com they didn't even call customers customers. They called them rate payers. And at that point it was just enough to keep the lights on and to keep prices low. But um, customers really expect a much better level of uh, experience from their utility. They want to, they think about the world's most advanced digital organizations, so like Disney and Uber and Amazon. And then specifically in terms of demographic shift, right? Um, Gen Z wants, you know, purposeful experiences tailored to their needs. And they want to communicate and interact with content on their own platforms in their own time. But I actually would argue that all generations want that, right? From the, you know, millennials to Gen Years to Gen Xers, which is what I am, to baby boomers. Like all customers sort of want what they want, when they want it, and how they want it. And you know, nobody has you know any time. They don't have any patience. They have zero interest in being able to navigate. They want zero barriers and they want zero effort. So this is why it's really, really critical to have a laser-like focus on customer experience. And my role really has been in um, making sure to marry the customer experience and the digital strategy together to help meet some of those needs. Um, so we have, um, you know, and you can see sort of some, 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 you know, pictures over, 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 over to the right, which sort of deal with how it is that we think about, um, you know, a seamless omni-channel experience. People want to be able to, if they want to talk to us on their desktop or on their, you know, I, on their, on their um, Apple Watch or via an Alexa or via their cell phone, they, they, they don't care. We need to be um, focused on that. Now, given that that, that um, customer choice, that customer focus on choice and control and convenience, we really need to re-shift our thinking to the utility of the future. And so from us, um, that really means historically we have had a focus in terms of how it is that we create value from a sort of a pipeline model. So we focused on the product. So we focused on sort of a volumetric load view and we now we need to switch to sort of what is a value-oriented view and how it is that we allocate capital and resources. And to think about customers, not only from a customer standpoint, but also from a producer standpoint. So think about the fact that, you know, customers are going to be looking at solar and they might be starting to produce energy. So for that, that means, you know, shifting away from this linear pipe model where we focus on delivering goods and services to end customers and optimizing, moving towards a platform model where we really try to enable transactions and interactions between producers and consumers where we create and curate content. And I think a big, huge example of that um, really could be in solar. Um, so I'll, I'll back up for a little bit. So um, um, because households and businesses have started generating en energy via solar, and there are well-known firms like, you know, Apple and Google who invested in renewables to power their operations and sell excess energy. Um, you know, there are more than now about a million homes that have been, um, that, that are now generating energy, um, right? California and Hawaii have adopted policies that pay customers to install small-scale renewable generation and feed it to the grid. So, um, you know, Overall in the U.S., like I said, there's about a million homes that have solar. Now, in the, in the ComEd service territory, we're still only about a thousand customers that actually have net metering, that have solar panels and that are generating and selling that back to the grid. But we are now examining on how is it that we develop an ecosystem that um, incorporates all different ways that customers want to interact with us. So here's a new way of looking at um, a customer user experience. Um, so it would allow, as it, this would be sort of an ecosystem that could help us build new experiences that could activate a value exchange with our customers. 
and really help us look at um, offering value-added products and services. So um, we launched the uh, Energy Marketplace on Black Friday last year primarily as an e-commerce site. And it sells things like you know, Nest thermostats and LED light bulbs, and you can have a discussion with an energy advisor. So that's a good first step. But we really want to be able to create more of an ecosystem where companies can do, where com customers can do a variety of things. They can purchase energy savings, home upgrades that can help them reduce, you know, their monthly energy bills. We could offer demand response programs and energy efficiency um, resources. We could integrate with any smart meter connected device or home automation um, system that they had in their house. And we could look at, you know, utility data. We could offer them energy insights. We could have them have some exchange of information across customers or across, you know, um, their energy advisor or their installer. And then, getting back to what I was saying about solar, we could actually provide access to distributed energy resources. So that would begin with solar and um, electric vehicles and battery storage um, options. So in the solar journey right now, we are developing or spent the better part of five years five months this, uh, this year looking at developing sort of what could an end-to-end -end, um, solar journey customer experience be. And um, we want to be able to allow customers to calculate the financial and environmental benefits of solar and then learn about and shop for and review different solar developers, on sort of like a Yelp-style review. We want to be able to automate their solar interconnection and net meter process process, and then provide them with a tracking tool so they can monitor and participate in rooftop install. And then separately, we want to provide an online forum and discussion board for developers. Now, none of this could be possible without us looking at um, leveraging data analytics and making sure that we show a 360-degree view of the customer by combining our um, you know, CRM databases you know, combined with customer-generated information. So that could be social media, that could be third-party resources. And we want to be able to combine the information that we have in the data lake, like you know, have a really robust understanding of, of customer energy profiles and behaviors, so looking at their customer-based segmentation and tie that to attitudinal and demographic data. And then offer personalized recommendations that will be, you know, try to increase their engagement with us the amount of time they interact with us, and also promote some adoption of energy um, services. Um, so that's sort of the holistic um, example. And um, I, I have a, just a really quick demo, and I hope you guys can be able to hear this. But this is just a, a, um, a pilot that we are going to be um, launching by the end of the year. Um, we will be able to um, hook up, um, I'm sorry, we, we, are, we are hooking up our interface system with Alexa, so people can um, start communicating with Alexa, and they can have they can. Um, it will be with Alexa, Siri, um, uh, Google Home, I'm missing one. Um, but anyway, I'll play the little video so you can see. Uh oh, you guys need to be able to hear that. Hold on. Uh, on again we're also working on some chat bots um, that are going to um, communicate um, um, with customers 
Um, but this is this is sort of all all connected into how is it that we start to meet customer ex expectations. Um, and you know the chatbot that we have launching will you'll be able to um, uh, check check your balance. You'll be able to report an outage. Um, you'll be able to report it for multiple addresses. Um, so that's the kind of um, those are the kinds of um, items that we're working on. Now I talked a lot about sort of you know my own career and what I'm you know what I've been doing and what I'm doing at um, ComEd. But I also um, I just actually had to speak at a um, a women uh, in power utilities um, uh, workshop a couple weeks ago, and um, um, as part of that we ended up reaching out to yeah, some CIOs and CEOs of different organizations and getting some advice from senior leadership. So um, so here's some sort of tips to kind of think about as you navigate a career in the energy industry. So my CEO is Anne Parmesori. And her comment is, um, communication is a part of leadership. People under want to understand where you want to take them and what the vision is, and they want to connect to that. Um, Mary Hager is the CIO of Amron, which is Down State. And treat others with respect, with respect and do unto them as you would have them do to you. It's sort of like the golden rule. Um, Kay Furman is the executive search partner at Hydric and Struggle, and her quote is, manage your personal brand in a digital world. Um, that one is actually pretty key. I, I, you would not be surprised at how many um, uh, resumes, or, or you know, how many resumes we get where people's LinkedIn profile picture is a picture of like them and their kids, or you know, them with their dog. Which it's lovely to have kids and it's lovely to have a dog, but you don't want to see that in somebody's LinkedIn profile. Um, okay, next one is um, at PPL, uh, VP of Transmission, Stephanie Raymond said, innovation can only happen with an engaged and diverse workforce. Be willing to show up every day as your authentic self. Um, Alice Jackson, who is a VP of Revenue Services at Excel, said, "Read voraciously and don't be afraid to ask questions." And then Leslie Siebert, the VP of Distribution at SoCal, said, "Take calculated risks, take chances, and get out of your comfort zone." And um, here are some of my own personal tips um, um, in terms of having, you know, success in, in a, or longevity, I suppose, in a career in energy. So I say um, it takes a village, and here I'm specifically thinking about in terms of mentorship. Um, so mentorship, sponsorship, um, just the ability to have people to talk to. Um, I would say that almost all of the career moves I have had, um, I have had different kinds of mentors, and, and different types of people serve as mentors throughout my career. And it's really necessary to do that. and to, and. Um, you know, it, again, you can't just rely on one person to um, help you develop, help you navigate your career. So it really, you know, it takes a village. Um, so my second point is um, go outside of your comfort zone. So I've taken on a couple of roles. Um, I would say my refinery supply and planning marketing role that wasn't that was outside of my comfort zone. Um, the role as um, in director of revenue management that was also outside of my comfort zone. So you know, make sure to take. Um, chances when you're tapped on the shoulder, or even if you are just sort of interested in a new area, um, think about being willing to do something that you know you didn't think that you could do, or didn't, you didn't think that would, you you would be a natural fit for. But at the same time, while you're going outside of your comfort zone, make sure that you play to your strengths. Um, so again, I told you guys how I did the work in terms of strength finders, and um, I have some specific strengths. My my strengths are um, I'm strategic, I'm an arranger, I'm great in terms of communication. Um, I have positivity, and I also have woo, which means winning others, others over, um, which I know sounds a little crazy, but it, it means you know, that you're um, good in terms of relationship management kinds of roles. Um, and so try to choose those kinds of roles that play to your strengths and try to shore up areas where you have opportunities for development. Um, next point is um, build a great team, and I cannot emphasize this enough. Um, your my, my my recruiting style is always try to um, get people to work for me who are smarter than me, who know things that I don't know, who will um, who will push me, and also people who I think I can develop, and people who I think will work together um, in a team well. And that um, I think is really critical. And if you take care of your team, they will take care of you. So that's really really important. Um, I spent a lot of time talking about putting the customer first, but particularly in an area like energy, um, historically the energy business has um, 
delivered things to customers based on what they thought they could do, and they really didn't even take the customer experience into mind. So this is um, a new focus in the in the in the universe of customer experience, but it's, it's critical in a way um, really what we need to um, set forth. And the last thing I would say is um, feed your soul. So I um, engage in a number of different. I, you know, we're not in school anymore, so I can't necessarily call it extracurricular. Um, but, you know, engage in a number of activities that make me feel whole as a person. So, you know, I told you that I'm a, a wife and a mother, but I also, you know, I sing in the choir at my church. I direct the, the youth choir in my church. I do quite a bit of volunteer work. That actually picture in the bottom right, I was actually selected excellent in, uh, volunteer employee of the year and ended up getting a $10,000 grant um, for um, the company that I'm on uh, and for the nonprofit that I'm on the board of. Um, and so um, utilities, and particularly energy industry, because they live and work in the community, they are responsible <clears throat> for um, being engaged in nonprofits that give back to the community. And I, again, volunteer in quite a bit of a few of those places. Um, you know, on the board for Merit School of Music, I still take voice lessons. Um, and so making sure that you do those things that make you feel whole and happy as a person and that you're, you know, contributing to the community. Um, I think it's really, um, it's really critical. Um, and I would just end with a little quote um, because, you know, our greatest weakness lies in giving up and the most certain way to succeed is someone who could just, you know, try just one more time. So you guys all know that, you know, Thomas Edison, I think it took him 10,000 tries before he successfully created the light bulb. So if you, if you're going along your career journey path and you feel like you're just not making it, you're hitting your head against the wall, keep trying, keep trying, don't give up. So with that, are there any questions? Uh, one question that I see is uh, someone I think is trying to get into the energy industry. What skills do you think people need to be successful as the energy industry is changing? Oh, yeah. So I say, um, I think what's unique about the energy industry is that there are different functional, if you have functional expertise, um, in a variety of areas, there is there is space for you. So, for example, um, you know, I spent a lot of time doing marketing, but there is, you know, there's marketing. If you have expertise in tax, if you have expertise in finance, if you've had expertise in, you know, operations or supply chain. Um, um, so, I don't I don't know if the person could sort of indicate what what area what is their specific area of expertise, but there are a lot of different areas of expertise where you could um, end up. Um, entering into the in, in energy company, and then once you're there, exploring a number of different areas. Now, in terms of the second, the second part of the question, what 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 things do I think, um, what competencies do I think uh, people need to think about in order to be successful in the long term? Given that it's changing so much, I would say innovation. I think is really needed. Um, there are many people who have been in the energy industry, particularly in utilities, for a very long time who don't necessarily think about new and innovative ways to focus on things. And this has become a huge focus for our company. Um, we had a, a, a big innovation fair um, at Exelon um, this summer, and we had about 2,700 um, uh, people in attendance. Um, but I would say innovation, you know, focusing on, on innovation, I think, is really critical. Um, and then, you know, some of the basic competencies that are important, like, you know, um, lead, you know leading with courage or um, 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 being able to, you know, lead, coach, and manage teams. Um, I think all of those kinds of things are, 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 are useful. But I think really with the, with the change, oh, I, I'm sorry, the other thing I would na really name, I'd say innovation is number one. Probably the second thing is adaptability because the industry is changing so often, not so often, because the industry is changing so rapidly, being able to um, be adaptable and be flexible and um, be willing to focus on innovative things, I think are probably, um, I think are probably the most critical I focus on. Can you share, um, the question is, what, could you share more about the different types of mentors you had and how you established your mentor relationships in your career? Yeah, so I'm an African-American woman, if you saw from the picture. So I have had mentors 
um, <clears throat> of all different, um, you know, I've had men mentor, me, I've had male mentors and female mentors, I've had black mentors and you know white mentors, I've had mentors in um, the, the the part of the business that I've been in and in a different part of the business. Um, so I think the the best way to establish a mentorship relationship is really around a relationship, right? People end up um, mentoring you if they like you, if they um, see themselves in you, and if they see that you also um, are willing to develop a relationship that could become a two-way relationship. The way that I have mostly developed relationships is at BP they actually had a formal process where you would would set up appointments with people called get to know you. And you could email someone and sort of say, you know, hey, I'm interested in having a 45 minute, you know, you could you could say, you know, 30 to 45 minute get to know you conversation. Um, and I'm interested and you would usually and, and you're going to talk to these people not when you're looking for a job. <laughs> you're going to talk to these people because you're interested in their career path, because you might be interested in their department. Um, and because you want to share with them a little bit about what you've done and your background and to see if there's any potential fit. So that is one good way to, um, you know, ask someone if they'd be willing to talk to you to get to know you. And then after that, if you end up um, hitting it off in that conversation, then you can, you know, reach out to them, you know, once a quarter or, you know, um, every few, you know, you can reach out. You can either um, see if you can come in to see them once a quarter, or you can sort of, you know, send them an email every, you know, eight weeks or so, saying, you know, hey, I saw this article um, based on this thing that we talked about. I thought this might be interesting. So you're kind of trying to develop a relationship. You're not, you're not stalking them. You're not, you know, it's it's, it's kind of like a combination of um, networking. But that that then ends up becoming a relationship. And then if that if it becomes natural and it seems like a relationship, you can then ask someone. To you know, if they would be interested, if 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 they would act as your mentor, um, and if they would help you know guide you, um, and then you could you know you could go to them for you know advice, bounce ideas off of them, um, talk to them about um, you know potential feedback that you got from your boss, that kind of thing. Does that answer your question? I think oh, I so. Think. I'm not. I'm not seeing any follow further follow up. Um, I see another question about, so you, you mentioned solar a lot. What other growth and renewable energies do you see happening? Um, in the energy industry overall, so I mentioned solar a lot just because it, comment right now we just passed the, um, um, future, en uh, uh, the future Energy Jobs Act um, and we have a huge, um, um, uh, we have a huge dollar amount devoted to solar and also a huge dollar amount devoted to energy efficiency. Um, but in the renewables areas, I think, you know, we're going to have huge growth and continue to have huge growth in energy efficiency and solar. I think wind is also going to continue to grow, um, depending on where you are in the U.S. Um, I would say the, those, I think, are going to be the, 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 the three large. I think, I think storage is going to end up becoming huge. Um, I think um, automated vehicles, so basically driverless cars, I think are going to be, become huge. And I think finally, after many, 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 many years, right, electric vehicles have been around forever, um, like, you know, more than 50 years. Um, but I do think that I do think that electric vehicles will start taking off in the near-term future. So those are some of the things that I think are going to um, end up impacting. And then I would also say from a, from a, from a, um, from an industry standpoint, I would say, you know, um, Industry, I think they, industry in terms of energy generation, I do think that there will continue to be more of a move towards cleaner operations. So we just spent um, a lot of time trying to focus on the zero, zero um, emissions um, portfolio, and we had big wins in Zec and Illinois and, um, and New York, and that's actually um, significant to us in terms of Exelon. Um, I would also say that from a mix from an energy standpoint, um, from an energy industry standpoint, um, there are some, you know, companies. Will, overall, companies will need to work with, you know, FERC, with the Department of Energy, with RTOs, with the state and, and Congress, and that, you know, PJM has a capacity market proposal in play. Um, there's a Department of Energy uh, a grid study on resilience and the need to protect 
um, base load, and that PJM and NISO and ISO are thinking about carbon pricing. Um, so I think those are some things that that could um, could come into play. And then I think market resilience I think will be important, right? Um, nuclear I think is really important because the, you know the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. Um, and but you know an all-in energy approach I think is a is a um, is a is a most long-term view overall. And then lastly, I'd say that um, I think that there will continue to be um, I think there will continue to be investment and focus in the customer side, and that means more focus on um, utilities and what energy companies are doing with utilities because that's really for customers, that's the most customer-facing um, side of, 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 uh, of energy. And from an oil, and, I, and I, I can't really, I'm, I'm a little out of touch with the oil and gas side. Um, but those are some things that I think are going to occur. Great. I think that seemed to me like a very thorough answer. Um, and you're talking about that uh, that when you got into utilities, finding out that a lot of things needed to be replaced in the grids and the power plants, and you mentioned there's been a lot of advancement. Is that is there also like upgrading to meet these new technologies? Yes. Yeah, so I, I, um, you know, we, we've at Epsilon we've been investing about a billion dollars in innovation pro projects over the next five years, and you know, probably 75% of that is going to be in growth projects. There's going to be some in efficiency and, and productivity projects, and they range in, you know, they range from things like R&D projects, like on digitization and energy storage, but hydrogen. So yeah, and I, I think I think that focus is happening because because companies probably don't want to get caught behind the curve like they did like we did in fracking. Like the whole I mean the entire energy industry was caught behind the curve in fracking. I, I don't think anybody expected that the that the gas shell boom would happen the way that it is. So I, I think a lot of energy companies are spending a lot more time and energy focusing on 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 um, innovation and new technology development because of that. Great. Um, well, that looks like the majority of our questions because some of these I feel like they were answered in your other answers, Jennifer. So, um, and it's only it's 12:53, so we don't have too much time, I think, to cover something else. Um, so I would I want to thank you so much for coming and joining us to be our speaker, and I want to thank everybody for attending this University of Chicago Alumni Association Career Month program. Um, you'll see on our website that we had 16 webinars this month of November, so we're about halfway through. So there are videos of the ones that have already happened and are more upcoming. I encourage you to re register for all that resonates with you. And you can find that all on our website, careers.uchicagoalumni.org. And Jennifer, thank you so much for sharing about your life and all of your expertise and helping us understand better about the energy industry. Is there any anything else you want to leave us with today? Um, no, I just I, I I should have put my email on here. But if anybody you know wants to have an offline you know chat with me, they can just they can shoot me an email or or find me on LinkedIn and shoot me an email. Great. So folks, if you have further questions, you can keep in contact with Jennifer. Thank you so much for presenting for us, and I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day. Okay. Thanks, Lizzie.